Greetings, stranger. Welcome aboard. I'm glad to see you've decided to join me after all. I now know whither we are heading. High Helm, that ancient and most illustrious Sky Citadel of the Dwarves. It is located in the Five Kings Mountains that run along the northern border of Andorran, which itself is northwest of Absalom. Thus, this ship will take us to Almas, the capital of Andorran, and from there we will meander our way across the burgeoning democracy into Falcon's Hollow in the Darkmoon Vale, and thence make the ascent along the slopes of Droskar's Crag, the volcanic crown of the mountain range. Once we're on the mountain roads, it will be a difficult and dangerous trek eastwards to Highhelm, but when we at last arrive in that great city, the journey will feel like a small price to pay. Yet here I am talking about the future when we should be focused on the present. I know your current interest. These cabin journeys do set an atmosphere of mystery, after all, creaking and rocking. You wish now to pass the time hearing me exposit on a creature seldom seen with mortal eyes, to learn of its nature, its habits, and, inevitably, its weaknesses, that you might exploit them in some hypothetical future encounter, slay or destroy the monster, and win fame and glory across Galadian. That is how these extracts from the Encyclopaedia Galadianensis usually work, after all. A perfectly reasonable desire, I freely admit. Yet this time, misguided. No, utterly mad. For nobody has ever ushered today's entity to its destruction, and in my opinion, nobody ever will, save perhaps for Asma herself even at the very unmaking of this world. This time, there is no investigation to be undertaken, and no opportunity for study to be seized. If you encounter this being, I am afraid it is simply the end for you. No grand conspiracy, no climactic final battle for the fate of the universe. Just death and silence until the end of time. Is this the sort of story you wanted from me today? Very well. Let's discuss the Grim Reaper, because it's real, and I've seen it. Have a seat and listen well. Or don't. This time, it doesn't matter. In general, when one discusses the uncommon or rare beings that inhabit our world, you can expect the common folk to be less certain of their appearances and natures. For unique beings, this is doubly true, with only a few notable exceptions. The unstoppable Tarask, spawn of Rovogug and engine of Armageddon, is one. The Grim Reaper is another, but its hooded, skeletal form is the only image most dare associate with it. From graveyards to fortune decks, the visage of this being is so completely universal that it seems to lurk everywhere at once, from the loudest metropolis to the humblest hamlet. Scholars speculate that our cultures may have been influenced by the gods themselves to ensure that the Grim Reaper's image is understood by every man, woman, and child. For what else could explain this symbol arising independently across Galarian? Whether you are hunting linorms in northwestern Aviston, or worshipping krakens in distant Wansho, you cannot escape the scythe-wielding harvester of souls. It has emerged like a cosmic warning in every mortal culture. And for good reason. The Grim Reaper usually adopts a humanoid appearance. Its true form is almost certainly known only to itself, for it is older than the skeletons it mimics. But even when so robed, it appears larger than most. It is sometimes seen sprouting two great black wings from its shoulder blades, but even if it does not don them, it remains always capable of perfect flight, and indeed seems to be swifter in the air than on the ground. Its flowing robes are tattered and shredded, and the figure beneath embodies the skeleton of the beholder. Humans see a human skull underneath its black hood, dwarves see a dwarven skull, and so on. The Grim Reaper always wields a scythe, as terrible in power as it is in presence, and unlike the blades of most creatures clever enough to use them, there does not seem to be anything inherently magical about it. In the hands of anyone else, the Reaper's scythe is indistinguishable from the lowliest farmer's. Thus, we know that it imbues any weapon it carries with the powers of death itself, and the few who believe that separating the Reaper from its scythe will somehow neuter it are gravely mistaken. For a being of its power, the Grim Reaper possesses relatively few supernatural abilities, but each is carefully tailored to fulfil its only ambition. 
Firstly, its vision is numbered among the most precise throughout the planes, for it always perceives things for what they truly are. You cannot conceal yourself in darkness, nor the invisibility of wizards, nor even in the flesh of other animals through polymorphy. The Reaper sees you, and all feel naked before its gaze. This sight goes beyond even the vision developed by mages to penetrate illusory things, which in comparison is but a crude imitation, because this true seeing also reveals a creature's health, emotions, and fears. It seems to perceive the very soul of its target, the spark of life that it loathes so deeply. Secondly, the Grim Reaper is true to its title as the Harvester of Souls, for any being it slays is forever damned. No soul can be resurrected if it has fallen to its scythe. Even the psychopomps of Phirasma cannot help its victims. The power to bind or otherwise sequester souls is not beyond comprehension in isolation. The archdevils are infamous for their infernal contracts, for example, and even mortal spellcasters of sufficient power can trap another's soul in a suitable vessel. The difference here is that the fate of the soul is unknown. The one dragged into the pit can be rescued, the one trapped in a soul gem can be freed, but the one pulled into the robes of the Grim Reaper is just… gone. Nothing short of divine intent could restore it, and even I do not know of any successful interventions staged by the gods. The sheer cosmic horror of this particular revelation takes time to set in. You see, the planar cosmologists among us have advised that life and death is a cycle. Our spirits originate in the positive plane, also called the Forge of Creation, and while they can undergo many rounds of evolution and change, birth and death, memory and loss, they remain always somewhere in the River of Souls. The scythe of the Grim Reaper extracts souls from this circuit, breaks the unbreakable wheel, and silences a little bit of universal noise. Eventually, it is whispered, this will be the final fate of every being until the planes drift through time in eternal, agonizing silence. Now the Reaper boasts a number of abilities to aid it in this mission. Beyond the scythe itself, which while terrible is only a single tool, it also wields potent magic. Being in the mere presence of the Reaper heralds misfortune, and many find that their stratagems and tactics end in misery by virtue of proximity alone. It can also bolster its natural speed and strength when needed, and shift between all of creation's planes without effort. It can also change its form through unfettered polymorphy, though it almost never has a need to do so. Rather, this power is implicit in the fact that it takes the form of a humanoid skeleton in the first place. Its trademark spell is the Finger of Death, which can instantly slay targets from a distance. Moreover, the Reaper seems to have an affinity for the undead, whose beings it can subjugate with little effort. This power seems strange at first for a being that operates in isolation, but it will be made clear soon. Finally, it also seems capable of summoning weaker versions of itself to aid it in battle, or to dispatch on errands unknown. These so-called lesser deaths, sometimes also called minor Reapers, are in a way even more obscure than their master. Some have named them avatars of the Grim Reaper, but that is a term normally reserved for the manifestations of the gods. Nevertheless, they do function almost identically to their progenitor, though notably without the ability to sequester souls into oblivion. It seems only the true Grim Reaper has that power. On the other hand, minor reapers do boast their own unique ability. They always pursue single targets at a time and ignore everything and everyone else until their task is complete. Often they will dissipate into nothing after slaying their intended victim, and it is probably this behaviour that has led some to believe that a reaper appears before everyone at their hour of death. In reality this is a misconception, and it has led to some confusion between minor reapers and Phirasma's psychopomps, whose job it is to shepherd errant souls. In truth, the psychopomps loathe and fear the reapers just as much as we do, but I digress. If anyone interferes with the Minor Reaper's headhunt, then another one will instantly appear at the moment of their interference to pursue the interloper. There does not seem to be a limit to this multiplication, and so a duel can quickly escalate into a harvest. 
I have witnessed many adventuring parties meet their dooms by the sides of lesser deaths, because functionally, this means each party member must single-handedly defeat their own quarry before helping the original target, and that is a nigh impossible task. Minor Reapers, unlike the Grim, can be summoned with some reliability, though doing so is never advised. Galarian's most powerful necromancers like Geb himself could conjure or create them just as a lesser mage might animate a pile of bones, but unlike the mindless servitude of baser creatures, I question the loyalty of reapers bound in this way. There is also a particular combination of harrow cards called the Dead Man's Hand that is said to be a lure for them. But it is not enough just to assemble the right cards on the table. No, this must emerge sincerely through legitimate fortune-telling and anyone who has ever witnessed it has either died or met a worse fate. It is for this reason that many Harrow decks do not include the visage of the Reaper on their cards to prevent the dead man's hand from emerging. So, let us return to the original Grim Reaper. What is the truth of its origins and nature? Well, I, I think I have the answer, or at least a lead, for a braver man than me to pursue. It is my belief that the Grim Reaper is intrinsically connected with the outer plane of Abaddon, sometimes also called Gehenna, Hades, or the Eternal Eclipse. I intend to explain the cosmology of the outer planes in full at a later date, but for now, just be aware that there are three planes of evil. The Pit, home of the Devils, the Abyss, home of the Demons, and Abaddon, home of the Daemons. And yes, I fully appreciate that the nomenclature is confusing, but please direct your frustration at the old sages who took that decision. Now, Arbidon represents evil in its purest form. Not bound by the pit's strict rules and regulations, and unaffected by the chaotic madness and wanton destruction of the Abyss, the nature of Arbidon is to bring death and ruin to everything in creation by any and all means necessary. Its native fiends, the daemons, routinely trade and trap souls. The devils of the pit love souls as well, but they only do so because they can be shaped into new lemures, whereas the daemons love them unchanged, trapped and held in stasis beyond the reach of the river of souls. Are the parallels emerging? Because I'm just getting started. Next, take a look at the Thana daemon. Uncanny, no? Indeed, these things could easily be mistaken for reapers, and their master is Charon the Boatman, the Horseman of Death, who is as close to a ruler of Abaddon as you will find. The Eldritch River Styx originates in his domain, and for a price, one of his Thanadamons will ferry you along it. These deacons take after their creator, and they do not think it is a coincidence that Charon himself has adopted a similarly recognizable guise. And Charon is divine a demigod of awesome power and ancient wisdom. He could easily have his own soul-hunting avatar stalking the plains. So, mystery solved? The Grim Reaper is the avatar of Charon? Well, not quite. The similarities are tantalizing, but there is a critical counterpoint. Charon's domain is specifically death by old age, patient death, and patience is synonymous with him. He is numbered among the most passive divinities, for he does not need to do anything to have his portfolio met. Mortals die. It is the one trait that binds them all together. It actually goes against his interests to kill prematurely, as it denies his particular form of death. And the Grim Reaper is not a passive being, it is a hunter, travelling from place to place, leaving thousands of bodies in its wake. So there must be another layer to this mystery. It is rumoured in the oldest tales that the four horsemen who rule Abaddon, of whom Charon is the eldest and most powerful, all revere a fifth. An archdaemon, some say the original archdaemon, who is alternatively called the first horseman or sometimes the fifth horseman. If he ever had a name, it is long lost to time, and he is known now only as the Oinodaemon. Charon is his first child, and he betrayed the Oinodaemon with his siblings, feasting on his form and powers to claim lordship of the plain. But the children could not kill the parent, so instead they dragged his body to a hidden tower called the Ruined Spire and locked the screaming entity deep within, never to be released. But what if the Oinodaemon had an avatar, or a loyalist? What if it was in danger of remaining in Charon's new realm and had to flee, or was set loose? to gather souls to feed the languishing god. 
What if it took on Charon's form in mockery of his domain to siphon the fear and reverence of mortals that would otherwise be directed at him? And what if the Oinodaemon, teetering on the edge of divine death, brushed against the negative plane, giving him a facsimile of undeath to the casual observer? Now that would be an explanation. Well, stranger, that's the Grim Reaper. I have only seen it once, from a great distance, and I was not its target, or doubtless I would not be here speaking with you today. I doubt I will survive a second encounter. Well now, I need some time to reflect on the nature of the universe while we sail the inner sea. It will be some time before we reach Almas, so perhaps enjoy the sun and salty air up top. It will clear your head from these dark tales. Meet me portside when we dock in Almas, and I will show you around. High Helm may be our destination, but the capital of Andoran is still nothing to sniff at. Well, until then. <laughs>